Welcome back, brothers and sisters in Christ. I hope you all are doing well. This is Seed Wars number 27. And if you've been following uh, the lecture series, recently we've been looking at Jacob and Esau and some of the very interesting details around their birth and the lives that they would go on to live. In the last lecture, we looked at the Proto-Evangelium that you know, the prophecy of the seed of the woman versus the seed of the serpent. And we're just trying to go through the scripture and and learn as much as we can about these more vague stories where we're given a little bit of detail, but we're not given enough detail to really clearly know what's going on. And some of these other biblical texts, like the apocryphal texts and some of the ancient uh, Hebraic writings that exist out there, they give quite a bit more information to, to paint a more inclusive picture of what's going on. And we're just going to continue to explore that today. Um, on the last lecture, we looked at the Book of Jubilees, and I'm going to quickly just review that now that there is, there is very, it's very evident who the seed of the woman is, and that will become quite clear in this particular account here. In the second uh, year thereof, Rebekah bare to Isaac two sons, Jacob and Esau. Jacob was a smooth and upright man, and Esau was a fierce man, a man of the field, and he was hairy. And Jacob dwelled in tents. Now, you got to understand that the writers of these books, including the scripture, they choose words very carefully. Words have power. And these words all have very, uh, there's big implications with these words. And as we've looked at in the past, it's demonstrating that Jacob is a upright, morally conscious man and a tent dweller where he's learning to grow closer to God through the study of the Torah. And it's the scripture here is going out of its way to make it clear that Esau, on the other hand, is radically different both physically and morally speaking he is a fierce man a man of the field which means he's a wild man and he's a hairy man he he, he doesn't they don't even look the same jacob is smooth and tall and esau is hairy and more hunched over and as the youths grew jacob learned to read and write but esau did not learn for he was a man of the field and a hunter and rather, he learned war, and all his deeds were fierce. As we've unveiled in the previous lectures, he becomes a, a nomadic type. He's a robber. He's a looter. He's a pillager, a raper, a killer. That's who Esau has become. And Abraham loved Jacob. He, he, Abraham as we demonstrated last lecture, Abraham was around when these boys came out. In fact, he got to watch them grow up until their 15th birthday before he passed away. And Abraham realized that Jacob was a good boy. He loved Jacob. But notice the text here says, but Isaac loved Esau. But, but Isaac loved Esau. In other words, somehow, and it's, it's, a, it's definitely a paradox, Somehow Abraham and Rebekah saw the truth that, that Jacob was good and somehow Isaac ignored or was blind to the truth. And Abraham saw the deeds of Esau and so he knew in Jacob that his name and his seed should be called and he called Rebekah and he gave her commandment regarding Jacob for he knew that she too loved Jacob much more than Esau. And he said to her, my daughter, Watch over my grandson Jacob, for he shall be in my stead on the earth, and for a blessing in the midst of men, and for the glory of the whole seed of Shem. And all the blessings wherewith the Lord has blessed me, and my seed shall belong to Jacob and his seed always. And of course, Jacob's seed is going to be the 12 tribes, specifically the tribe of Judah is where the seed of the woman is going to be passed through and that's going to lead all the way down to king david and king david's going to lead down to jesus christ and that seed 
the seed of Jesus Christ will always be blessed forever. And he goes on to say that in his seed shall my name be blessed and the name of my father's. See, he's not only looking forward to Jacob's future seed, but Abraham is also looking back retrospectively to the ones that came before him and including the major patriarchs, Shem, Noah, Enoch, Mahaliel, Enos, Seth, and back to the archetype himself, and that is Adam, the one that God made in his image and in his likeness. And so this is the seed of the woman. Now, there's an image over here on the right where we see that Jacob is making a, a, pot, a, a pottage, uh, the soup, and Esau is about to sell his birthright. And we're going to continue to explore that today. It's a fairly accurate rendition. However, this guy here on the left is not nearly hairy enough. According to the scripture, his hands and his arms are as hairy as a goat's and his neck, his whole body is covered in hair, and it's red from head to toe. And as we're going to see in a moment, in this image, uh, Esau should be wearing particular garments, or he should have some garments with him that are the garments than the mighty hunter King Nimrod, by whom Esau has just slayed earlier this same day, and has been in great battle as Nimrod's men have been pursuing him, and he's literally fearing for his life. And Esau, I can assure you, he's in good shape. And he's been moving as fast as he can today. And now he's finally outrun Nimrod's soldiers. And he's showing up here at his father's tent, uh, where Rebecca and Isaac live. And it's in this context that he's about to despise his birthright, which, as we saw in the last lecture, had to, had a lot more to do with it than um, just the soup. Yes, it's true. He's hungry, and he's a prideful man, and, and he's a man who likes to have a full belly, and so he wants to eat. But uh, beyond that, he gets into a, a theological dissertation with Jacob, about the resurrection. And as it turns out, Jacob is actually mourning the death of Abraham, who died earlier this very day. And as we learned last time, the reason Abraham died this very day is because God had made a promise that Abraham would die and go to be with his fathers and he would die in peace. And God did not want Abraham to be subjected to knowing what his grandson Esau has done here recently, which is murdered a man, raped a woman, and despised his birthright. And so it's, it's a very bizarre uh, things that are happening here. And there's a lot going on. And, and I'm sure there's a whole multiple layers and levels of, of different things that we can glean from this. But at this moment in time, Jacob is doing the family tradition, which is called the mourner's meal, when you mourn the death of someone important. And according to their Hebrew heritage, they would, they would make the lentil bean, which has a shape to it, a round shape to it. And the way that they roll around in the pot as you stir them, it reminded them of how um, sorrow and death is this constant circular thing that happens in all people you know we're all born and then we lose our lives and so it has this symbolic meaning so jacob being the good you know god loving torah worshiping young man that he is he's preparing a pot of lentil beans to represent abraham as his great his grandfather and when esau comes up on him he says hey what are you doing with these beans and Obviously, Esau doesn't know about Abraham's death, or maybe he does, but that's not something that's inferred in the text. And Jacob says, I'm mourning our grandfather, Abraham, by doing the traditional mourner's meal. And, and I'm, and I'm um, blessing these to Abraham 
so that when Abraham comes back in the resurrection, he'll he'll you know re- not necessarily reward me, but he'll he'll acknowledge me that I've that I've done this for him. And this leads us to this interesting conversation between Jacob and Esau about the resurrection. See, Esau is not a man of the spirit. The Holy Spirit is not present in Esau's life. And I don't believe he's part of the seed of the woman, which would explain that. Um, He's a very genetically, morally, and physically corrupt man. And he's got no desire to believe in spiritual things, just like we have in the world today. We've got believers and we've got atheists. And, you know, trying to have a conversation with them is often can lead into more of an argument, uh, which, you know, we try not to get into with these people. But nonetheless, everybody's entitled to their own opinion. And Esau was of the opinion that life is about today. You do what makes you feel good. You enjoy the fruits of your labor now. And uh, you eat whatever comes across your path, whether it's clean or unclean. He felt like the whole concept of clean and unclean animals back then did not apply to him like it did all of the rest of his family. He had no problem eating the creeping and crawling things and the pig. And as a matter of fact, according to the legends of the fathers, the the Hebrew fathers, he even ate dog. And it was actually dog that he takes into Isaac when he's a blind old man. Um, When he goes out to hunt the venison, he strikes out on getting a hunt. And so he just comes back and slaughters a dog and makes the savory meal. And that's what he takes to his father. And so in this particular context, Jacob and Esau are wrestling with the idea of an afterlife and resurrection. And Jacob is saying, guess what? We're all going to be judged for the deeds that we do on this planet And there is going to be a resurrection of the dead in the future. And Esau says, well, if that's true, then how come Adam hasn't resurrected from the dead? Or Noah? And therefore, Abraham will not either. And and basically, what happens is, is Jacob says, look, if you don't believe in a future resurrection and, and in the spiritual blessings to come, then why would you want the birthright? See, the birthright has to do with the spiritual walk of these Hebrews. They follow Yahweh. They believe in God, and they know the Proto-Evangelium says that one day their seed will crush the serpent's head. And so that that's the blessing to be, the birthright is to be within the seed of the woman and to pass it down to your progeny so that one day you can participate in the fulfillment of that prophecy and to be an overcomer of the enemy and to have redemption for what took place in the garden. Well, Esau doesn't believe in any of it. So what's the point of having the birthright, Esau? And 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 so Esau agreed. There is no point in the birthright. And so he sells his birthright to Jacob. And as we see in these other texts, it's not just strictly for the food, but also, according to the legends, um, Jacob pays him some coin, some money. And we'll see here in a moment when we get to this part of the lecture. It's actually for the cave of Machpelah, the cave of the patriarchs that would typically pass down through the eldest son, the burial grounds of all the patriarchs, and also he gives him the sword of Methuselah. And so uh, we're going to take a look at that in more detail here in a moment, but Esau feels like he's, you know, come out, come out of this looking pretty good. He got a full belly out of it, he got a sword out of it, and he got some money out of it, all the things of the flesh. Now, later when the boys are a little older, and Isaac is an old man and he's blind, Genesis 27 says that when Isaac was older and his eyes were so dim that he couldn't see, he called Esau, his older son, and said, My son, behold, now I'm old. I do not know the day of my death. 
Now, therefore, please take your weapons, your quiver, and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt wild game for me, and make me a savory meal such as I love, and bring it to me that I may eat, that my soul may bless you before I die. Now, Rebekah was listening when Isaac spoke to Esau, his son, and when Isaac went to the field to hunt game, Rebekah spoke to Jacob, saying, My son, obey my voice according to the command. Go now to the flock and bring me there two choice kids of the goats, and I'll make savory food for them for your father, such as he loves. And then you shall take it to your father, that he may eat it and bless you before his death. And here's the part that we're going to focus on in this lecture. Then Rebekah took the goodly raiment of her elder son Esau, which were with her in the house, which were in her house, and she put them on Jacob, her younger son, and she put the skins of the kids of the goats on his hands and the smooth part of his neck. So we see that Rebecca goes into her tent and she grabs Esau's goodly raiment, which essentially translates as desirable or precious clothing. Now, this is really interesting because, for one, we need to understand where these clothes came from and why is it that Rebecca has them in her, in her house. See, at this point in time, the boys all have separate tents. Isaac and uh, Rebecca live in one tent. Jacob and Esau likely live in their own tents. And... Rebecca understands that in order to totally convince Isaac that Jacob is Esau, she's going to have to pull out all the stops. And one of the stops is to dress Jacob up in the goodly raiment, the precious uh, clothes or robes. And what we're going to find out is these robes were the infamous garments that King Nimrod was wearing when Esau slayed Nimrod and he stole the precious garments. And we'll look at that in a moment. Now, when Esau comes in back home from that event, he decides to preserve those precious garments. Obviously, he isn't going to wear them all the time. I'm sure he pulled him out for special occasions. It's difficult to say. But we see here that he kept him in his mother's house. Now, the Jewish commentators in the Jewish encyclopedia state that Esau was well aware of the obnoxious and untrustworthy nature of his wives, who were the daughters of Heth. See, at this point, what the King James has not told us that we'll learn in a later account is that Esau totally violated the, the um, duty of maintaining the Semitic bloodline and he mixed with the wicked and evil Canaanites. Now, I believe he did this. I, I think that he was just, this was his predisposition to do this because he really rejected everything to do with the seed of the woman. And I think it was a natural tendency for him to do that because he is part of the seed of the serpent and, and those are his people genetically. And so he felt more connected to them. And we'll look at that at another time. But he married the daughters of Heth. And Heth means terror. Heth is the father of the Hittites. He's the, he's the son of Canaan. And it's a wicked seed line. It's a contaminated gene pool. And they are very unrighteous and wicked in all their ways. And there's some future texts that we're going to look at that, that get into the details of these daughters of Heth, how, how they would burn incense for Baal and Moloch. They um, were very idolatrous and they were very wicked. So Esau didn't trust his ability to put these special garments in his own tent. And the commentators within the Jewish encyclopedia said he would not be able to entrust those garments in their care, so he stored them in his mother's tent. And this, this gave opportunity for Rebecca to go 
and retrieve, retrieve them when she needed them so that she could put them on Jacob here in this particular account. And a few verses later, we see that when Jacob brings the meal to Isaac, Isaac says, come near now, my son, and kiss me. And he came near and kissed him, and he smelled the smell of his clothing, and he blessed him and said, surely the smell of my son is like the smell of a field which the Lord has blessed. So we're beginning to see that there's something very unique about these garments that, that Jacob is wearing. And um, it has to do with the fact that Nimrod himself wore them and actually he obtained them from a very interesting source that we'll look at in the future. So Lewis Ginsburg, who put the compilation together of the legends of the Bible according to all of the ancient oral and written traditions of the Hebrew fathers passed down from father to son, goes into great detail about how wicked Esau was and how God ended up having to cut Abraham's life short by five years because he made a promise to Abraham and he was going to keep the promise that he would go to his death in peace. And how could he possibly go in peace knowing that his grandson had committed the following crimes? He ravished a betrothed maiden. He committed murder, which we'll look at in a moment. He doubted the resurrection of the dead, which is what led to him scorning his birthright and denying God. And Ginsburg goes on to describe this particular murder. And he says, the men that were slain that day was Nimrod and two of his uh, soldiers. A long-standing feud had existed between Esau and Nimrod because the mighty hunter before the Lord, that is Nimrod, was always jealous of Esau and what a what a powerful hunter he had become. One time when he was hunting, it happened that Nimrod was separated from his men and only two men were with him. And Esau, who laid in ambush, remember now, he is a mighty hunter and a warrior. He laid in ambush in isolation and he waited until he should pass. Then he threw himself upon Nimrod suddenly, and he felled him and his two companions. And the outcries of the latter brought other soldiers and attendants of King Nimrod to the spot where he lay dead. But not before Esau had stripped Nimrod of his garments and fled to the city. The scorn manifested by Esau for the resurrection of the dead he felt also for the promise of God to give the holy land to the seed of Abraham. He did not believe in it and therefore was willing to see the birthright and the blessing attached in exchange for a mess of pottage. And in addition, Jacob paid him in coin and gave him what was more than money, but the wonderful sword of Methuselah. So now it's time to change gears and take a look at the mighty Nimrod. There are many legends around King Nimrod and his famous garments, as well as the legends of the Tower of Babel and so on and so forth. The one thing that we take away from the scripture is that Nimrod was truly the mighty hunter before the Lord. And we're going to look at that phrase in a moment, what, what that means exactly. But in pretty much every account that you could ever read about Nimrod, you'll always see the same portrayal. And that is a large, strong man, proud, who's usually covered in some kind of animal skins and using weapons because he is a, an excellent hunter. And so for Esau to be able to kill Nimrod is quite an accomplishment because Nimrod is probably one of the few out there who are really a a worthy adversary and a contemporary of someone of Esau's abilities and prowess. Now, just to demonstrate how famous and popular Nimrod was, I want to put some things into perspective here. In Genesis 10, we're given what's referred to as the Table of Nations. This is basically a genealogical record of Noah and his three sons and how they would go on to repopulate the entire planet after the flood. And what you'll find is that 
we're told about Noah's three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And it lists off in chronological order all of their sons. And out of all of the men that are listed in this entire account, there's only one person who has any extra details listed about him, and that's King Nimrod. We're told here in verse 8, the sons of Cush are Seba and Havilah and Sabta and Rama, and the sons of Rabba are Sheba and Dedan. And then here it is. And Cush begat Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord, wherefore it is said, Even is Nimrod the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech and Akkad and Kelna in the land of Shinar. And so I think that this just really demonstrates the popularity of Nimrod. There are a lot of names listed right here of the repopulation of Earth. And only Nimrod is given extra attention in detail. That really corroborates and just substantiates how famous he really was. And we get that feeling here in the text. Verse 9 when it says, he is a mighty hunter before the Lord, wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. See, wherefore it is said is inferring that men knew about Nimrod. He was popular. He was famous. It was said that he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Everybody living in the Mesopotamian region at that time understood and knew the name of Nimrod. And he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. That's what the text says. Now we're going to examine that very closely because the way that we interpret that in the English is not really exactly the translation that is trying to be demonstrated. It sounds like Nimrod was a mighty hunter before the Lord in the sense that he loved the Lord and he went out and and killed the animals and sacrificed to Yahweh. But as we'll see in a moment, it was actually anything but that. He was a mighty hunter in front of the Lord, in face of the Lord. And we'll look at those words a little more closely in a moment. Before we do, we see that Nimrod is the one who starts Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Kalna in the land of Shinar. And so Nimrod is the, is the first man after the flood to produce a kingdom. He's the first king, and he's the one who would start Babylon and the Tower of Babel. And he's the one, this is where the Sumerian writings of Akkadia come from. And a lot of the literature that's out there is all during the era of Nimrod. So Nimrod is the one who's going to erect the Tower of Babel. Akkad is where we get the word Akkadian. Akkadian. The Akkadian culture and language is some of the oldest culture in the world. This is in the land of Sumer in Mesopotamia where the Sumerian tablets come from, like the Epic of Gilgamesh and so on and so forth. This was all done in the land of Shinar, which the word Shinar me means the land between the two rivers, the Tigris and Euphrates. So this is uh, this is really what's called the the Fertile Crescent or um, the Cradle of Civilization, where everything kicked off after the flood. And the word Nimrod actually means rebel, to be rebellious. Nimrod was the first rebel king after the flood. He's the great grandson of Noah, and the founder of Babylon, Shinar and Ur of the Chaldees. If you recall, Ur of the Chaldees is where Abraham is called out later in the scripture. He's called out of the Ur of the Chaldees and told to start walking towards Canaan, the promised land that God's going to give him. And Babylon, Shinar, and Ur of the Chaldees is the area where there's a lot of witchcraft, sorcery, um, sacrifice, idolatry, and so on and so forth. 
Now, this is what the Jewish Encyclopedia has to say regarding Nimrod. They say that his kingdom was infamous, that the land of Shinar in those days was also known as the land of Nimrod. The ancient rabbis interpreted his name as the one who made all people rebellious against God, and that's through the, uh, the Tower of Babel. Now, after the destruction of the Tower of the Babel, the rabbis, by the way, referred to the Tower of Babel as the Tower of Nimrod. After God comes down and confuses the language and causes the dispersion of the people, we see, according to ancient rabbinic tradition, that Nimrod changes his name to Amraphel. Amraphel, which translates, he whose words are dark. And this is very interesting because other than these couple of verses that we just reviewed in the Table of Nations in Genesis 10, we're not told anything else about Nimrod. And this is a great example of how the Old Testament uh, it was written. We're given some very uh, vague miscellaneous details about characters like Tubalcane and his sister Nema. We're told a few details about people like Nimrod. And it's really difficult to discern all of the, the depth about that era and what was going on. But the fact that King Nimrod supposedly changed his name to Amraphel is interesting because Amraphel appears in the King James Bible in a couple chapters after the Table of Nations in Genesis 14 with the battle of the kings with Shedelamor and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah. And we'll look at that here in a, in a future account. And so it appears that Nimrod continues to live on, but under a different alias, if you will. Now, ancient rabbinic legend states that Nimrod was the first man after the flood to introduce meat to humanity, and also that he was the first one to start and make wars with other people groups and to enslave people after the flood. And he was considered this master hunter and a manslayer. And there is some biblical truth that lines up with this. We know that before the flood, man was not allowed to eat meat. Of course, the Nephilim changed all that. They were eating animals and they were cannibalizing human beings. And so uh, meat eating got introduced to humanity illegally before the flood. After the flood, God makes a covenant with Noah, says, I'll never flood the earth again, puts the rainbow in the sky. And he tells Noah, be fruitful and multiply and now you can use these animals however you want, including meat eating. So it becomes legal after the flood. But according to the legends, Nimrod is the one who really exploited that fact in such a way that it became a, a, a planetary uh, introduction to all of humanity on his account. So in Genesis 10, Nimrod is referred to as the mighty hunter before the Lord. And we need to take a look at a couple of those words to really try and discern what's what's being conveyed. The word mighty hunter, the word mighty is the gibberim. That's the same word used in Genesis 6 when describing the Nephilim, the giants. And there are a lot of theologians that theorize that Nimrod himself was a Nephilim, that he was a giant, and that he was a hybrid. And there's really no way to completely corroborate that notion, but I think that there are some clues within the text that, that substantiate it. So the word Gibberim means a warrior or a tyrant or a giant. And Nimrod was referred to at that time as a mighty hero. And the word hero used back then is a completely different context than what we use today. If today someone read that Nimrod was a hero, they think that he was a, a savior who was doing 
courageous acts worthy of being a hero. But that's not what the etymology of the word was back then. We've looked at this in previous lectures. The etymology of the word hero actually comes from the Greeks, Homer and Hesiod's Iliad and Odyssey. And it's specifically in reference to a demigod like Hercules and Achilles, a half human, half God, which we've conclusively connected to the Nephilim. And so this is another important clue that when Nimrod throughout history is referred to as a mighty hunter and a mighty hero, it's not suggesting that he's a hero in the context of what we think of as a hero today, but rather that he was the true definition of a traditional hero. He was a demigod, half human, half angel, Nephilim. And so the fact that he's called a gibberim, which is the same word used in Genesis 6, there were giants in the earth in those days and also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and bared children to them, the same became the gibberim, the mighty men of old, men of renown. And that's another clue there, that the Nephilim and the gibberim are men of renown. They're famous. They're infamous. And that's exactly who Nimrod becomes after the flood, just like we reviewed in the Table of Nations. He's so famous that it was said amongst the men of that era that he's a mighty hunter before the Lord. He was an infamous man of mythological status. Now, where things get a little complicated is the English translation of the words and, and the way that we interpret these sentences. When it says in Genesis 10 that Nimrod began to be a mighty one in the earth, and that he's a mighty hunter before the Lord. That gives this interpretation that he was this mighty hero who was doing acts, courageous acts. He was doing these benevolent deeds before the Lord. But when you look at those words more closely, you begin to see that it's a different definition. For example, Nimrod began to be a mighty one in the earth. The word began actually means to begin to profane, defile, pollute, and desecrate something. It also means to violate the honor of something or to be dishonorable. Someone who would violate a covenant. Someone who would profane a covenant. And so when it says that he began to be a mighty one in the earth, it means that he began to profane and defile and pollute things on the earth. And this is also true for the next verse, that he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. You see that word there and you go, oh, he, he was a hunter before the Lord. So he was doing things for the Lord. Well, again, if you look at that word, the word is panim, Strong's age 6440. It has many, many different possible definitions. It can mean before, but many times it's used as the word face. 390 times in the scripture, panim is used as the word face, that, that someone would do something in face of somebody else. And we'll, we'll explore that in a second. But the other possible translations are that he was a mighty hunter in the sight of the Lord. 67 times that word is used in sight of the Lord. 17 times in the scripture it's used against. He was a mighty hunter against the Lord. And so what we see is that in the 1604 King James translation, when they were reading it out of the Septuagint, or out of, excuse me, out of the Hebrew, the Greek, they had to make a decision on, on the English translation, and they chose the word before. But when you look more closely at the word, and you look at how it's been used in context, the definition of that word is to say and do something to anybody's face. It's someone who's bold and fearless, who 
is very free and frank in how they speak, that they'll speak in a very impudently and insolent way as if they're speaking in contempt. We see in Job 1, God will curse thee to thy face. He's, he's not afraid of you. He'll, he'll say it right to your face. Or God moved upon the face of the waters in Genesis 1. In Leviticus 20, we see the same word being used. I'll set my face against that man. And so I believe the proper translation here is most likely consistent with this. That Nimrod began to defile himself, to pollute himself in spite of the Lord, or in contempt of the Lord, or in the presence of the Lord, or in the face of the Lord, that he didn't care that the Lord was watching. He was big, bad Nimrod, and he would do whatever he want. He was a mighty hunter, and that's not just hunting animals. He was a manslayer. He was a mighty manslayer before the Lord. And that is, that's really the only logical connotation that we can extrapolate when we put all of this information in context, because it's very clear that Nimrod was an evil, wicked, and unrighteous man who did not follow Yahweh. And so that's the proper interpretation of that expression, being a mighty hunter before the Lord. So now let's take a look at the book of Jasher, chapter 27. And Esau at that time, after the death of Abraham, frequently went into the field to hunt. Notice that the writer of Jasher includes the detail after the death of Abraham. He included that detail because it's understood that Abraham had just died earlier that day. Now here in this particular account, we're not giving any context of time. It doesn't say when he died, but based on all the other details that we've surmised, it's, it's during this exact time. After the death of Abraham, Esau went into the field to hunt. And Nimrod, king of Babel, the same was Amraphel. We talked about that a minute ago, that um, after the Tower of Babel was collapsed and there was a dispersion of the people, and Nimrod sort of lost his foothold on Babylon, he changed his name and continued to reside in that same area as King Amraphel. That Nimrod also frequently went with his mighty men to hunt in the field and to walk about with his men in the cool of the day. And Nimrod was observing Esau all the days, for a jealousy was formed in the heart of Nimrod against Esau all the days. Now that's an important sentence. We're seeing the old lion who's been observing the young lion. Nimrod is a mighty hunter before the Lord. He is a mighty, ferocious, fierce hunter and warrior. And he's been watching Esau because Esau is cut from the same thread. Esau is also a very mighty and fierce hunter. And Nimrod recognizes that Esau is a threat to him and so he's been keeping an eye on Esau, and he's formed jealousy against Esau in his heart. And on a certain day, Esau went into the field to hunt, and he found Nimrod walking in the wilderness with his two men. By the way, when you see that expression, on a certain day, the writer is trying to illustrate that it wasn't just any particular random day, but it was on a certain day, something Something special happened that day. And we know what it is. It's the day that Abraham died. Esau went out to hunt. And later on that day, he's going to sell his birthright. So it's a particular day. And he found Nimrod walking in the wilderness with his two men. And all of his mighty men and his people were with him in the wilderness. But they removed at a distance from him. And they went from him in different positions to hunt. And Esau concealed himself for Nimrod, and he lurked for him in the wilderness. Now the word lurked actually means to remain hidden so as to wait in an ambush. So at this point, Esau is going to ambush Nimrod. And Nimrod and two of his men that were with him came to the place where they were, 
And Esau started suddenly from his lurking place, and he drew his sword, and he hastened, and he ran to Nimrod and cut off his head. And Esau fought a desperate fight with the two men that were with Nimrod. And when they called out to him, Esau turned to them, and he smote them to death with his sword. So this is a pretty vivid scene. Basically, Esau is out hunting, and he sees none other than the most famous man in the land, his contemporary, if you will, Nimrod, who shows up with two of his soldiers. Now, this is a pretty big moment for Esau. I mean, it's a pretty bold move to make the decision that you're going to wait and try and take out King Nimrod. Only a great and mighty warrior and hunter who's killed and had much experience would dare make a decision to do this. Not only because of the magnitude of Nimrod and his, his famous background, but also there's two other soldiers with him. So Esau's taken on three guys. The other thing that we see here is that we're told that Esau used his sword to cut off his head. This is the first time that we're told about another weapon. We know that his, he's famous for his quiver and his bow. So Esau could have chose to shoot Nimrod from a distance, but he wanted it to be personal. He waited till Nimrod got close, and then he decapitated Nimrod. You know, a very thrilling, a very thrilling and valiant hunt, if you will. And then we're told that he fought a desperate fight with the two men. So that means that it was a difficult fight. He didn't get the, the sneak up on them. After he cut off Nimrod's head, he had to do hand-to-hand -hand combat with two soldiers, and he killed them. And then all the mighty men of Nimrod who had left him to go to the wilderness, they heard the cry at a distance, and they knew the voices of those two men, and they ran to know the cause of it. And when they found their king and the two men that were with him lying dead in the wilderness, and when Esau saw the mighty men of Nimrod coming at a distance, he fled and thereby escaped. But not before Esau took the valuable garments of Nimrod, which Nimrod's father had bequeathed to Nimrod, and with which Nimrod prevailed over the whole land, and he ran and concealed them in his house. So this is an important detail. Once again, we see Esau took the valuable garments of Nimrod. That's very interesting because we know in Genesis 25, or excuse me, Genesis 27, Rebekah goes into her tent and she retrieves the precious raiment or garments of Esau. And so as we're going to see in this account, these are the garments that Esau has stripped off of the dead King Nimrod. That he decapitated him, he killed his two soldiers, and then he stripped him down into his birthday suit, possibly even naked for all we know, and he fled. Now another detail that we're told here is that Nimrod received these garments from his father. They were bequeathed to Nimrod from his father, who was Cush. And in the next lecture, we're going to look exactly where Cush got those garments. And it's a very interesting source. And we'll save that for the next lecture. And then we're told, and with which Nimrod prevailed over the whole land. See, Esau took the valuable garments of Nimrod, which Nimrod prevailed over the whole land. In other words, these were the garments that Nimrod was famous for wearing. They were the, the hunting and the kingly animal skins that Nimrod always wore. That when you saw Nimrod, he always looked the same. He was a very distinguishable guy because of the way he appeared and the way he dressed. And it was this appearance, this, this famous appearance of him that allowed him to prevail over the whole land. He was a very le he had a very legendary status of the mighty hunter before the Lord. Now we notice that Esau did what anybody would do. He tore out of there as fast as he could. 
and he ran home into a sanctuary, into a safe place, and he concealed them in his house. And Esau took those garments and he ran into the city on account of Nimrod's men who were pursuing him. And he came unto his father's house, wearied and exhausted from fight. And he was ready to die through grief when he approached his brother Jacob and he sat before him. And he said to his brother Jacob, Behold, I shall die this day, and wherefore then do I want the birthright? So, this sort of ties us back into the King James Version. We're told in the King James Version that Esau was out hunting. It doesn't tell us why. It doesn't mention what he was doing. But it says that he came back home and that he was faint. And the word faint means to be completely wearied out because you just overcame some great journey or some great toil. Well, now we know what that toil was. And we also know that in the King James Version, Esau says, please give me some food because I'm on the point of death. I'm about to die. And we see the same thing here, that he was ready to die through grief of this traumatic experience that he was just involved in. And we know from looking at the other texts that this is the moment in time where he questions Jacob about the lentils. And Jacob says, I'm doing the mourner's meal, which is a Hebrew tradition that we do when people in the family die. And as you know, Esau, our, our father, our grandfather, Abraham, has just died. And this is where we get into this theological debate about the resurrection. And Esau demonstrates that he's just a man of the flesh and not a man of the spirit. And there's really no reason for him to maintain the birthright. And so verse 12, Jacob acted wisely with Esau in this manner, meaning that he, he recognized the situation and he was able to take advantage of it. And Esau sold his birthright to Jacob. For it was so brought about by the Lord. So the writers of Jasher are recognizing that this was God's plan that Esau would despise his birthright. And this next part is a very interesting portion. Verse 13. And Esau's portion in the cave of the field of Machpelah, which Abraham had bought from the children of Heth for the possession of a burial ground. And Esau also sold to Jacob, and Jacob bought all this from his brother Esau for value given. So it turns out that when Abraham had just come into the land of Canaan, he, God said, I'm going to send you to a land that I'm going to give you. Well, the Hittites, the Canaanites, the Amorites, all of them were living in the land. These are all the giants and all of the seed of the serpent. They all come through the wicked line of Ham and Canaan, the cursed seed of Noah. And they are the seed of the serpent, without question. And when, when Abraham came into the land, his wife Sarah died. And Abraham went to the sons of Heth, who were the Hittites, and he negotiated with them a deal where he would buy the field of Machpelah. Now, on this field is a cave, a sepulcher, they call it, a burial ground where Abraham wanted to bear, bury Sarah. And as it turns out later, this is also where Abraham's buried, where Jacob and Leah are buried. And so it becomes known as the the field of the patriarchs, the, the burial place of the patriarchs. And typically, this um, land which Abraham purchased, which we'll find out later was for 400 shekels of silver, that, that is something that gets passed down to the eldest son as the birthright. And so naturally, that was passed down from Abraham to Isaac. And now that Isaac is on his deathbed here shortly and will be buried there, it's going to then get, would be get passed down to Esau. But since 
Esau is selling his birthright, Jacob is able to negotiate that land treaty from him. And it says that he sold it to Jacob and Jacob bought it from him for the value given. Well, the value given was 400 shekels of silver. So we can assume that Jacob purchased that from Esau for that given price. And verse 14 says, And Jacob wrote the whole of this in a book, and he testified the same with witnesses, and he sealed it, and the book remained in the hands of Jacob. Now, this is basically one of the first law land contracts that we see in the Bible. We know Jacob was a learned man. He learned to read and write. And so he drafted a document, a, a, a land deed, if you will. And whether Esau signed it or not is hard to say. Esau wasn't a learned man. He didn't know how to read and write, but he may, he may very well have put his X, you know, marks the spot, so to speak, his, his scribbly signature on, on this document. And Jacob even had others witness it the same way that we do today whenever we have legal documents we draft a document we have witnesses testify that they witnessed the transaction and then he even sealed it how he did that we don't know perhaps he used a signet ring or some kind of oil and he stamped it but nonetheless it's it's like it's like a notarization he notarized it so that it becomes a, an a, a legal and official document and he put it in his book and it remained in his hands so that if anybody questioned him, he could prove that he was the legal proprietor of the field of Machpelah and that Esau no longer owned it. And verse 15, when Nimrod, the son of Cush, died, his men lifted him up and brought him in consternation and buried him in the city. And all the days that Nimrod lived were 215 years old. So it's a very interesting account, and we're going to explore this uh, field of Machpelah here going forward. But we see that, you know, Abraham ends up getting this field from the sons of Heth. Well, as we've mentioned before, Esau married the daughters of Heth. He wasn't supposed to marry outside of uh, the Semitic bloodline, but he did. And so, you know, th this is probably the connection point. The reason that Abraham was um, able to uh, get, get into an agreement with, with Heth is because Esau has, always, has already married into the family of, uh, of the Hittites. And so that may have lent some kind of uh, relationship or connection with his grandson's um, daughter and her family. So as you can see, it's a pretty fascinating story. And, you know, what's interesting is how Abraham um, goes into this agreement with, with the sons of Heth, who are essentially his enemies, so to speak, in the sense that Abraham is of the seed of the woman. They are of the seed of the serpent. But, you know, at this point in time, Abraham, even though God has promised this land to him, Canaan, that technically speaking, Abraham, this is his land. At this point in time, he's just a squatter here. You know, he hasn't been commissioned with going and destroying and rooting out uh, the Canaanites and taking over the land. And in fact, that won't happen for another 450 years. Um, that, that doesn't happen until after the Exodus, when Joshua brings the, the Hebrews into the promised land, and then he is the one who's commissioned with going through and rooting out all of the Hittites and the Canaanites and the Amorites and, and claiming the land. And so, you know, Abraham is, uh, he, he has not been the one specifically who's been commissioned with, with destroying these people groups. And so at this point in time, he's just looking for a place to bury his wife. And as we'll see in a moment, 
One of the reasons that he chooses this burial ground is because the legend has it that this is where Adam and Eve were buried, that they were buried in the cave of Machpelah. And the ancient legends say that this cave was actually the entrance to the Garden of Eden. Now, there's no way to corroborate any of that, but we'll explore that in the next lecture when we're looking at, at the cave of the patriarchs. But nonetheless, it's interesting to think that um, Abraham was rubbing elbows with these people groups, so to speak. At this point, he wasn't really mixing with the people, but we do see some different various accounts where he negotiated with some of these men and, and, and was in one accord with them at times. And to demonstrate this point, this takes us to Genesis, Genesis 15, where we realize that, yes, Abraham was called out of the Ur of the Chaldees. God brought him into Canaan, and Abraham began to settle there. But it was not Abram's commission to wipe out all of these Hittites and the Canaanites. But rather, we're going to see that that was Joshua's plan many, many centuries later. And we see this in this account. Um, and when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. And this is where Abram, Abram has uh, this dream, where God comes to him in a dream. This is before his name has even been changed to Abraham. And in his dream, um, what Abra Abram learns from God is that God says, you can know with a surety that your seed are going to be a stranger in a land that's not theirs and that your seed are going to have to serve these strangers and these strangers are going to afflict you for 400 years. This is the prophecy of, of um, the Hebrews going into Egypt for 400 years in the Exodus account. And also that nation whom they shall serve, that is the Egyptians, will I judge and afterwards they shall come out with great substance. And that's exactly what happens. God sends Moses into um, Egypt and Moses brings the 10 plagues, including killing all the firstborn children. And then he, uh, the Pharaoh decides to let the Hebrews go. And then God ends up destroying the rest of those Egyptians in the parting of the Red Sea. And we know that when Pharaoh lets them go, that the Hebrews leave the Exodus with everything from cattle and sheep and um, gold and silver and, and, and so on and so forth. So God is giving Abram a vision of this future prophecy. And then verse 15, And thou shalt go to thy, father, thy fathers in peace, and thou shalt bury, be buried in a good old age. So this is where God is promising Abram that, look, you're going to live a long life, and when you die, you're going to go to your fathers in peace. But as, that, as we've reviewed before, because Esau is so wicked, and on the day that Esau really goes full tilt and starts doing all these wicked things, God decides to shorten Abraham's life because Abraham would not be able to go to his grave in peace if he witnessed what caused uh, what Esau was up to. And then here's an important verse, verse 16. But in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. So here God is saying, after 400 years in the fourth generation, your seed, Abraham, who are going to be captives in Egypt all that time, they're going to come back to this promised land where you are now. Uh, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full, meaning that there's a specific timeline when God plans on destroying all these wicked Canaanites. And it's not until all of their sin and all of their iniquity is completely full. And so for the 400 years that the Hebrews are in uh, Egypt as slaves, these Amorites and these giants and these Canaanites and these Hittites are all gaining a stronghold throughout the land of Canaan 
committing all of this idolatry and darkness. And then when, when the prophetic time is right, when the prophecy has been fulfilled and the 400 years are up, then Moses is going to come and he's going to liberate them. And he's going to take them through the wilderness and eventually pass the baton to Joshua. And Joshua is going to lead them into the promised land. And it's Joshua who's commissioned with destroying all of these wicked seed lines and taking over the land. And so this explains why Abram is free to negotiate with the, the sons of Heth over the burial ground. Because it's not his commission to destroy these people at this time. Because the iniquity of the Amorites has not been fulfilled. And in the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto your seed I've given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river Euphrates over all the peoples, including the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cabanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Raphaims, which we know for a fact are giants, the Amorites, where King Og of Bashan, the 12-footer giant, comes from, and the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. And so to just to, to try and summarize that whole thing, Abraham is living in Babylon, in the land of Shinar, in the Ur of the Chaldees, under the reign of Nimrod. And then God calls Abraham out, and Abraham migrates into the promised land where really he's just a, a a squatter and a sojourner at this point and there he has isaac the promised seed and from there isaac has jacob and esau and jacob is the promised seed and jacob will give birth to the 12 tribes of israel and one of those tribes is joseph and joseph is going to be sold into bondage into egypt and while he's in bondage, he has the gift of interpreting dreams. And he interprets Pharaoh's dreams. And in doing so, he earns his freedom. And Pharaoh makes Joseph the number two guy over Egypt. But eventually that Pharaoh dies. And a new Pharaoh comes on the scene. And the new Pharaoh recognizes that the Hebrews are a threat. So he enslaves them for 400 years in bondage, which is a fulfillment of Genesis 15 that we just read. And then just like the prophecy says, God sends Moses to liberate the people. And we have the, the, the ten judgments and then the great exodus where they leave. Um, and we have the parting of the Red Sea. And then Moses leads the Israelites through the desert for 40 years where they're murmuring and griping about everything. And at the end of Moses' life, he passes on the baton to Joshua and Joshua leads the people across the Jordan River. And now the time of the Amorites has been fulfilled. Their iniquity has been fulfilled. And Joshua has been commissioned with doing the battle. And we see in the book of Joshua how he and the Israelites supernaturally go across Canaan and slaughter the 31 different kings and take over their kingdoms and they conquer the land of Canaan and it becomes the nation of Israel. And so I think that's a good place to stop. And uh, when we, um, on the next lecture, we're going to take a look at where King Nimrod's father Cush actually received these garments. And we're also going to take a closer look at the cave of the field of Machpelah, where Abraham negotiated a land treaty with one of the sons of Heth, who was one of the wicked serpent seed line. And so on that note, Godspeed, and we'll see you on the next one.